Can you see my screen? Just want to confirm. We can. Yes. Great. Oh, great. All right. Off to a great start now. I'm pulling the virtual office. I used a, a photo of our office here. Um, but my name is Amy Gursky. I am the Director of Client Strategy for Cause and Effect Strategy, which is a partner of LPA. And today I'm going to be talking about the beloved topic of adoption and how we can ensure greater adoption for our anal analytics and AI projects. I'm going to run through uh, a really quick situation that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, we have Doug here. Doug is in charge of analytics for his organization. Uh, he has been working to establish some dashboarding so that the employees can be more productive. They have visualization into what's going on within the organization. You know, he uh, sends this email out to the team saying like, hey, guys, I've, I've been able to do this. Here's a document on how you can use it. Here's some of the benefits. And then, you know, roaring applause from the crowd. They're all excited. And then within a couple months, users start not using it. Um, Doug begins to question, you know, why? Why is this happening? You know, they're excited at the beginning and then and all of a sudden what's happened? This is very common within organizations. Again, I think all of us can actually relate to this or been through a change or an implementation where we've run into exactly this. So let's look at why companies actually fail. Um, when we talk about BI, when we talk about architecture, when we talk about data lakes, I know this LPA team on the phone spends so much time with you guys working and planning to ensure that these programs are a success. We need to do the same thing when we're looking at adoption, implementation, and utilization. So we need to do just as thorough of a discovery during that pre-implementation that we do for our BI, for our architecture, as we do for the change and adoption. Uh, how does this play into the long-term plan? What is the impact on the organization? Are we providing learning in the right capacity to the right people in the way that they need to learn when they need to learn? And do we have misaligned user functionality? You know, I think what I could use is this, but what is actually needed by the users is X, Y, and Z. Lack or no executive endorsement. I know personally, I've worked through um, many, many careers in my life uh, and worked with many different organizations. And what I found is if we don't have the support at an executive level, um, someone endorsing why we're doing this, likely we're not going to get the attention. It'd be like your sister telling you not to do something when you're growing up versus having a parent tell you. You do need that hierarchical structure and support from the executive level to be able to adequately uh, endorse and support change. A steering committee, you know, we can't do these things alone. When we talk about change, when we talk, talk about programs, even if Doug is creating that dashboard on his own, when he goes to implement that and roll that out, he needs a team of peers that are on his side to help him lead that. And again, are we adding additional tasks to the plate without the removal of any? Again, that goes term towards the long-term roadmap. Uh, are we being fair to our employees with what we're asking them to do? And then again, what I see continually throughout um, pretty much every single industry is a focus on the what and not the why. So we're going to launch this dashboard. Why? What's that impact? Because that is what we're selling into the organization. We've seen this. We've talked about this concept. Uh, LPA and cause and effect are on the same page with this. We talk about people, process, and technology. You know, right off the bat, we know that you guys have selected best in class in regards to technology. If you're on this call and you're working with LPA, you're working with best in class. We're not so much worried about that. Now, can we optimize it? Absolutely. Now, when we're creating these programs, when we're creating these initiatives, we should be building them into the process. If we're launching a dashboard, if we're doing shipping projections, or we're doing student churn analysis um, or demand planning, whatever that is, if we're building something that someone's supposed to be utilizing, we need to make sure that that is embedded within the process because we know that people leverage technology, but they follow process. If we don't take the time to add the initial steps into the process for people to be able to follow, likely they're not going to follow up because they won't remember. And last but not least, are we addressing the people? How are we addressing change within the organization and how are we addressing those people? You can have the best technology, you can ingrain it into the process, but if you're not looking at how people are using this or how it's impacting them, 
then likely the change is going to fail. And why is that? Now, the change curve, uh, I know everybody loves to talk about change. And instead of using a corporate example, because I'm sure we could come up with 400 times that change was uh, either forced upon us or rolled out in, improperly. Uh, but let's look at a personal example. COVID hits. Uh, everyone's locked in their homes, working from home, kids are home. You take away your son's tablet, son or daughter's tablet. Um, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to go into shock. What is happening? I, I don't, this is not possible. So then they go into denial. There is no way that my parents would take the tablet. Not only is it going to make their life miserable, but they know that I'm just not going to be happy about this. Then they get frustrated. Like, I don't get it. Like, I'm, I do things around the house. I do what I can. What am I supposed to do with my time? And then they go into depression where they sulk into the corner of their room. The world is over. They don't have a tablet. They forget there's trees outside and that the world is actually ticking along. Then they begin to experiment. Oh, hey, it's spring. Yeah, COVID's here, but I can still go outside and do really fun things. I can go ride my bike. I can go for a walk. I can go for a hike in the woods. Then they make a decision to actually participate. And finally, it's integrated into their daily process. We all know that we've had to change habits and we all go through every single one of these from diet to children, to partners, to changes at work, like implementations of new technology or expansions of programs. Now, the reason why it's even more challenging in the work environment is because it's not just us. It is every single person in your organization going through the same process at different rates. So how do we address that? You know, I hear all the time, why are my adoption rates so low? Uh, you're human and this is normal. What ends up happening is we have a current state. When we're making a change, when we're implementing a new technology, when we're doing new dashboarding, when we're, um, you know, consolidating all of our data sources so that our analysts can better access them, we're going to have a period of disruption. And as an organization, we need to ensure that our employees know that there is going to be a period of disruption that we expect them to have challenges and that we need them to communicate with us so that we can continue to take down those walls and barriers. But we can't lie to ourselves and think, oh, hey, current state, I'm gonna take off and we're off to the races, everything's gonna be great. We know that anytime change happens, that it's going to slow our progress, but we know the adverse impact of that is a greater success in the future. So what we need to do is make sure that we're accelerating through the period of disruption and really upping that communication. Now, the reason this is in a really uh, simple activity to go through as a leader, as um, a part of a team, is we know individuals at every single level of this hierarchy. And this is Maslow. I obviously did not come up with this myself. When we talk about a change in dynamics, whether it be working from home or utilizing new technology, uh, you're going to have individuals that are highly engaged. You're going to have people that are not engaged at all, and you're going to have people that you literally don't even know why they're working for the company. We can very easily assess the situation. There's going to be bias related to it, but what I want you to pay attention to is really what they're looking for. So it's not about the employee being not engaged or the employee being highly engaged but more so what they're looking for. So for someone who's engaged, they wanna feel that they're important to the organization. How do we do that through this project? What's their impact? Now there's a process for adoption. My background, uh, which I did not start off with, is in supply chain engineering. And I worked for Granger for about 17 years doing supply chain consulting with global organizations and had the opportunity to move over to Amazon, where I was uh, part of the Amazon business team and launched professional services, customer success, uh, solution consulting, and a bunch of other really cool things. So I have lived this process and I've seen it work. What I also know from my supply chain days is that I do need a process. If I just think I can go at this in a creative fashion and then I'm gonna succeed, I'm gonna be mistaken. So what we do is we go through this process is we address it step-by-step. Let's look at Doug and how he could potentially have done this over. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to create a sense of urgency. So lackluster results. Current state, we rolled out a program uh, and it didn't hit the adoption numbers, right? Doug's pretty disappointed. There's a loss of interest in the project and he's feeling pretty defeated. All right, so in this moment, we need to ask ourselves why. Again, this comes not to the how, but the why. Does this make a large enough impact on the organization? What is the scope? 
if it doesn't have enough of an impact, maybe we need to see this project and roll it out with something else to make sure that we have a big enough impact to warrant a change. We can't roll out 600 projects a year and expect everybody to pay attention and adopt all of them. We as an organization need to be smart about how and when we position projects and roll things out to our teams. Who does this impact? How do we ensure that we're communicating to the right people? And how do we quantify that impact for them as to why they need to make that change? So let's take a deeper look at this. Doug's new why. You know, does it make a large enough impact? All right, well, the investment of Cognos in and of itself has the potential of saving the organization substantial savings while decreasing errors, which has been a huge concern for Doug's company. Who does this impact? All distribution employees. Geez, that sounds pretty large to me. And then what's the quantifiable impact or reason to change? And this is something that your partners can help you do is actually document the process savings associated with making these change, changes. So you can hang your hat on it, but also provide the motivation to employees for why this change is important. For Doug, an estimated 440,000 in redundant process savings in phase one alone. That's pretty substantial to me. Then we go to building a guiding coalition. You've heard um, uh, mentioned prior to um, POCs, you know, proofs of concepts, MVPs, minimum viable products, all these things. What we're doing is we're building out a concept and then we take that concept and we need to build a powerful coalition of people that are also excited about this. This is not the entire distribution channel. This is executively endorsed. This is a small group of individuals, depending on the organization between five and 14 people of mixed diversity. And by that, I mean different departments, different levels, different tenures. And then we're looking at behavior, not personality. So we've also probably worked for organizations where we have our best friends that we always wanna work with because we work well. Well, guess what? We need to make sure that this change impacts everybody and just buddying up with the ones that we constantly work with isn't gonna give us the diversity of ideas and behaviors that we need to address. We also wanna focus on individuals that are respected as they become excited about this project and they start rolling it out and talking about how it's impacting them, others are gonna to wanna to follow due to that respect. Then we need to form a strategic vision or initiative. Essentially, we're putting together a bullseye. I've had clients put together a statement as long as the top one and as short as the bottom. I personally prefer something that's quick, easy to the point that's easily addressable for everybody in the organization, such as the bottom one. Now that we have the bullet, the target, whatever it is that we're shooting at here, now it's time to enlist a volunteer army. This is taking that coalition and starting to expand that scope. We've now tested the POC, we've done the MVP. We know that we have excitement, accuracy, and trust in the data. Essentially, the reason why change fails is because there's no trust. By having this group of respected individuals testing out this POC or MVP, and then launching it to the company because they're respected, they're building that trust and starting to spread it. So we're looking at people that are gonna see the value of the mission and reasoning behind the logic of this proposed change. And again, we're looking at multifunctional and multi-leveled individuals to make sure that everybody is seen and heard. Next, we enable action by removing barriers. These are things such as embedding this within the process and the organization and things such as listening. It's, I can't emphasize this enough, and I'm sure you can all say, uh, it's very difficult to work from an organization where you feel like you're not heard. Things like voice of the employee, one-on-one, um, -on -one, structured one-on-ones, -on -ones, unstructured one-on-ones, -on -ones, surveys, metrics and accountability. You guys have some of the best software that you can actually track how the implementation is going, the usage, who's using it, what are they getting from it? And we can turn those individualizations, power, powerful visualizations to demonstrate the usage to the organization to continue the motivation. Then we need to generate short-term short wins. Uh, if you've ever tried to make any sort of improvements uh, in your life, such as going on a diet, you want to make sure that you celebrate those short wins. Or even if you're, you know, going through a move, taking a break just to say, all right, the boxes are done. It's a good place to go. We need to motivate ourselves by celebrating these short term wins. This can be done by communicating through email to, to motivate the team, be utilizing those vote, uh, visualizations and making sure that we're giving recognition where recognition is due. Everybody wants to know that they are seen and heard. 
And lastly, we need to sustain acceleration, right? We've all been a project where we feel like we're losing steam. And it's the one thing to achieve those short term wins, but we need to accelerate as we go through um, that valley of despair or that adverse impact on performance. This is when we're going to re engage the executive support and we're going to look for encouragement. We're going to re demonstrate those short term wins. We're going to show how close we are to hitting the goals that we want to hit. And again, we're going to document and share those with every single person and thank them for the efforts in this. Last but not least, we're going to institute this within our organization. Um, and what does that look like? We're really anchoring the change within the organizational culture. This is change and going through a change of process may seem very difficult and it will be, but it's beginning to use a muscle that maybe you haven't used in the past. But once you start to do it, and once you get comfortable with this process, employees begin to think like this, they begin to process information, they begin to automatically look for a guiding coalition. They look to want to succeed and demonstrate because executives are supporting those that are going out there to make themselves known and to roll out changes within the organization. And with that, I'm going to open it up for any questions and hopefully some answers for you guys. All right, awesome. Thanks, Amy. Um, I love the example, you know, with Doug. Uh, I, I think a lot of folks on the line can probably relate uh, to that. Um, so it's really helpful to see that whole entire process and to break it down into manageable chunks too. You know, I think one of the reasons it's so overwhelming is because people think, oh, wow, geez, change or user adoption of something new. And it just, it feels so big, but if you can chunk it out, it definitely feels more doable, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so let's get to a couple questions. Um, so, so one question here um, about, uh, how to go about doing this, you know, in terms of time that it seems like it might take a lot of time to do this. So is this something you need to do with every single launch or um, how do you advise moving forward with something like this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I know you and I have spoken about this before. You know, when we are working with clients, first things first is we want to optimize what we have and then we want to go from there. <laughs> Right, and so um, just like any other change, this um, using change and implementing change, you're gonna go through a period of disruption. That's where typically uh, organizations will turn to yourself, myself to help them just initially begin to spec this into their daily practices. So again, we chunk it down into little bite-sized pieces and begin to um, kind of drizzle or sprinkle change throughout the process. So it's almost invisible to the end users and they're going through it without even knowing that they are. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I love that too, that, you know, it's almost um, say subconscious, but it, it's not, it's not as in their face, right? It's just, it's slowly trickled over time. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other kind um, of process that can be used uh, to establish change or is this the only kind of way that it should be done? Yeah, no, that's a great question. There are a lot of models for change out there. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to use this model most frequently just from a high level to um, get understanding of what people are going through and how we can best implement that. When we're talking about small changes, this process is going to take so short. When we're talking about very large engagements, this is going to take so much longer. But what you asked about is the process. When we embed change within everything that we do in the organization, again, it becomes second nature. So again, the time on the front end to actually put this within the process pays dividends on the back end. Um, yeah, that's what we see. Yeah, awesome, okay. Um, and okay, another one. Uh, do you, can you recommend any resources to help folks like in an advisory capacity who wanna try and do this on their own? Like what are some resources they can they can use? Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually going to go to my next slide because this um, leads right into what you and I have been working on creating together, which uh, is really using uh, three different tools. So creating a readiness assessment to figure out where organizations are and are you ready to impact change? Project based change plans. So, Liz, I know you do this with your clients. You know, how are we going to embed this within the organization project by project? Uh, do we need to consolidate projects? And if so, does that impact how we want to make a change? Again, LPA has these on their website and forms that you can submit. And answering your following question, the project integration. Um, I know when I'm trying to make change in my life, it's really important that I have accountability 
and someone mm -hmm. to kind of help me through it the first time. That's what we over at Cause and Effect do, and I know LPA does as well. Um, and we're there to hold your hand kind of through the first process, make sure the bumps in the road are as smooth as possible, and make sure that you're equipped with all the tools that you need from communication to accountability and tracking. Awesome. That was great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Don, do you want to jump in? Is there um, anything else you want to address here? Sure. Um, and Amy, thank you so much for uh, that great presentation. And um, I am going to uh, grab the ball back from you. Uh, and um, we're going to wrap up uh, a little ahead of the time today. But before we wrap up, um, I would like to uh, ask Annie to um, share the results of the uh, second poll. And um, so I could put that, you know, just a comment here. I got uh, one other slide after this. But, um, um, if we could share the, um, the poll number two results, Annie, that'd be great. Um, and just uh, I put an answer to one of the questions in the chat box that uh, all of these presentations will be available uh, next week at some point on our website. Um, I, again, I'd like everybody to feel free to, um, you know, forward the links, uh, suggest to other of your colleagues in your organization about different of these presentations that they may uh, be interested in. Um, in, in getting access to. Um, and let me, I'm going to just click to this last slide here, uh, Annie, while you're getting the uh, poll tool number results uh, put up. Just as a reminder, um, you know, these are the various folks and presenters uh, that you uh, heard from today. Um, and I'll go in reverse order. Amy from uh, Cause and Effect Strategy. Um, David Russell, our Chief Technology Officer, um, Liz Herrera, uh, who gave three presentations on advanced analytics, um, Brendan Austin, who did our uh, financial analytics and demand forecasting and planning presentation, and Rich Chester, who led our um, uh, uh, Cognos presentation. So, uh, um, the poll results are up. Uh, if you'd like, I can just talk through them a little bit. Uh, in general, we didn't get a whole lot of answers, but uh, we, I can talk through what we did get. Um, that would so, be great. Sure. So the first question we asked is whether we really had a data scientist on staff or not. And uh, of the people that answered, uh, the majority did actually, uh, but it was split pretty evenly um, between the two. Only a couple more uh, said they did than didn't. Um, then we asked whether your organization has used external data sources in your advanced predictive solutions. And uh, actually the majority of respondents said that yes, they had. Um, well, okay, no, the majority of respondents said that he didn't know <laughs> whether they had, uh, but a close second was that yes, they had <laughs> external data sets, which is interesting. Um, frequently, our clients uh, are haven't been able to do that in the past, and we're working with them to add that. So that's an interesting uh, note. Um, and then we asked, has your organization implemented any AI or machine learning projects into production? Um, the majority of respondents said that no, they hadn't. Uh, a few said they didn't know for sure. And then uh, there were a few that uh, had actually achieved that goal. Um, we asked whether the organization had a strategic plan for implementing AI or machine learning in the next six months. Um, again, in this case, most people responded either they didn't know or no, they didn't. We did have three uh, that said that yes, they did have a, a strategic plan in place for uh, implementing AI or machine learning. Um, we asked how people were feeling today. Uh, either great, good, or so-so, I really wish this pandemic was over. Um, that was evenly spread across those three responses uh, of those that responded to the poll. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, we had a tie on uh, whether the 
working remotely has made you more productive, less productive, or about the same of those that responded. Um, we had equal numbers that said more productive and about the same, uh, with only one respondent saying that they felt less productive um, with the remote work, which is interesting. Uh, certainly shows that most of us are uh, technology based or, or you know analytics based, if you will, um, and not necessarily based on service in all the cases. Um, has COVID created opportunities to do analytics differently in an organization? Um, and this was evenly spread, yes, no, and don't know, uh, with a few more saying yes, it has um, done that. So we asked, are you happy with your current data management and analysis platform, whether it's a data warehouse or a data lake or other? Um, and interestingly, of those that responded, they were evenly split um, between those two, uh, yes and no. Um, so that's probably pretty typical, um, I think. Uh, we asked if you, the organization currently using any cloud offerings as part of your data and analytics solutions. Similarly, in this case, we're evenly split between yes and no, uh, with only uh, one of the respondents saying they weren't sure whether they were or not. Um, those that responded uh, most were not using the cloud. Oh, wait, no, that's not true. I need to add all the rest of them up. Uh, of those that responded, we had a few that said no, they weren't using the cloud at all. Um, and then they were evenly split between people that were only using one vendor. I would say most of those, of those that were using cloud vendors, most are using at least two. Um, and then we've got several that are using four or more cloud vendors. Um, yeah, I was already... I didn't know I thought it started. And then we've got a, a last yeah. question or last uh, question on the poll was, uh, does your organization have a formal change management process that assists with making new technology uh, projects work? And uh, of those that responded, uh, we actually, the majority do. Um, we had uh, slightly fewer uh, saying that they do not have a change man management process. A few respondents that just don't know whether there's a process in place or not. Um, so that was our poll. Um, so Don, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, David, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to uh, the participants that have hung in there uh, for the whole time. Uh, we've had uh, several folks uh, hang in for the, the whole afternoon. We hope you enjoyed this and um, certainly send us feedback. Um, we, we would like to um, get feedback to continuously improve these events. Um, and, uh, you know, we did one in the spring. We just did this one. We'll look forward to doing another one in, uh, in a few months and your feedback would be appreciated. Um, and uh, you can always reach out uh, directly to any uh, any of the LPA folks that you uh, have worked with or know, or my email and uh, phone number are right on this last slide here as well. So with that, I'm gonna call it a day and um, thanks all. <laughs>